To conclude today's program, I would like to introduce our next conversation. Will I Am has contributed to music, pop culture, technology, and education in many different ways. You may know he has received seven Grammy Awards and two Emmys, but you may be surprised to learn that he was also awarded an honorary fellowship at the Institution of Engineering and Technology. Will is a technology and AI entrepreneur and a committed STEM advocate. But my favorite fact about him is that he is the first person to send a song to Mars. Broadcast live from the Curiosity rover, it is aptly titled, Reach for the Stars. Will is a strong believer in the power of international connectivity as a tool for creating and collaborating remotely to solve problems. A belief our solver team certainly share. Joining Will in conversation is Vilas Dar, a solve advisor and a leading voice on technological equity. Vila serves as president of the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, which is committed to advancing AI and data solutions to create a more equitable, sustainable future. We are incredibly grateful that among the many ways the foundation supports Solve, they have created the AI for Humanity Prize. I know this will be a terrific conversation, and I'm delighted to welcome Will and Vilas to Solve at MIT. Thank you, Rafael. I'm so delighted to be here with you today, um, and particularly to be here with technologist, entrepreneur, philanthropist, my friend, Will I Am. Will, I'm so delighted to be in this chat. Um, I know that we're talking today to MIT solvers, a group of people who are setting out to do two things that I know is really important to both of our hearts. The first, to figure out how you use technology to solve some of the greatest challenges facing humanity, itself a really worthy endeavor. But the second, a little bit more nuanced, to figure out how we use technology to let us achieve our most human aspirations, our ambitions, our ideas of what it is to be human. As I've thought about these two challenges, I've been reflecting on the idea that technology has moved from the idea of building products, more hardware, more phones, more watches, to building the kinds of things that actually let us connect more deeply, that let us be more creative, that let us think about what it is that we want to achieve in our individual selves and in our communities and build more. But with that power also comes a responsibility to think about design. How do we design technology in a way that supports a design of a society? that we think is ethical and equitable and sustainable. And one of the things that I think we've come to is the idea that to design that world, it's not enough to just leave it in the hands of technologists. We need to bring in philosophers, artists, people who bring lived experience to the table. Well, there's nobody I can have this conversation with more than I think of somebody who brings all of those um, ideas and philosophies to this work. I wonder if you'd share with us a little bit about your work at the I Am Angel Foundation how you think about the integration of STEAM into classrooms and building pathways for everyone, about inclusion into this world we're bringing. So I started the I Am Angel Foundation just a little over 11 years ago. Um, and we focus on robotics, um, engineering, autonomy, computer science, and getting kids in, in the inner city and encouraging them down this path. And the reason why um, I think that's the most important thing to focus on as a, as a, you know, somebody that's made it out the ghetto, that has the ability to go back to the ghetto. Um, it's super important because the world tomorrow is super autonomous. It's super robotic. And there's not many people from the black and brown community routing the algorithms and training the data. And if we're having, we're barely scratching the surface on fixing police brutality in our community. Imagine what 30 years looks like and no one, you know, is brought up to speed on, you know, autonomy literacy or understanding the complexities of robotics and these, you know, predictive machines that are going to be deciding, you know, how we live and, and how, you know, the conditions of life. 
um, in the in the inner city, um, all the way down from teaching a child in the inner city. We've seen how COVID shook up the world where kids are learning from home. That's just on this iPhone that was designed when the world wasn't shut down. This device told us that now you teach on it. There's cases where, where parents are like, my son, he was failing miserably last year and now being taught at home, he's getting A's. Why was your kid getting A's? Is it because the teacher is slacking off? We don't, we can't calculate just how teaching is being done during COVID. But that brought up insight where now we need new types of teaching machines, let alone computing machines. But when it comes to teaching machines that, you know, can design how it's teaching specifically to the child's needs, that's pretty awesome if you think about it. But who is writing the algorithms to make sure it's morally correct? We know of data biases. Is that also going to show up in the algorithm on machines that are helping to teach kids? Is it going to be, you know, are data biases going to find themselves in police drones? Are data biases going to show up in, you know, um, diagnosis and people's premiums on their health insurance go up because of other machines that would, that were, uh, you know, calculating and learning all their behaviors from toys that they played when they were 10. Like all these unknowns we need to prepare for. So the, the diversity is now an ultra urgent thing that we have to solve. Not diversity just for, you know, the workplace, but in preparing tomorrow's place. Mm -hmm. You need a diverse, not only musicians and you know, creative is a part of the process. You need black, white, brown, rich, poor. You need a plethora of folks that are involved in the creating of these tools or else you're going to have folks that feel like they're not represented. You're going to have folks that are like, you don't speak for me. We have that in politics. Imagine when the machine is cognitive and, you know, ultra predictive and suggestive that giving you suggestions and predicting what you're probably going to do 10 years from now. If people don't look like me that built those things, well, damn, what the F? It's super important. It's just the most important crossroads that we've ever had, or else we're going to have some crazy tomorrow. Right now is crazy. It's crazy if you're a black man in America, a black woman in America, a brown woman or man in America. It's crazy. If you're living in the inner city and you think the police is supposed to protect you, but it's harming you, it's nuts. Now, what does tomorrow look like? When, a, when the stop sign or the, or the street light is also a drone. Yeah. You know, well, as you talk about this, I'm drawn back to the core message here, right? Technology can be something that propagates the power structure we've built can be something that propagates the inequality that exists in our society today. But it doesn't have to be. A lot of yeah. what you're talking about is how do we take the technology out of the hands of people who are trying to propagate the existing infrastructure and give it back to the people who are living the problems that need to be addressed, who are living the lives of aspiration that technology can support. We think a lot about something that we at the foundation call an idea framework, right? A lot of this will be familiar, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. Those aren't just words about how we think about the world. We have to actually couch the creation of new technologies right at the heart of those ideas. We talked, I think, earlier today with an organization called Waukesha AI, who won the AI for Humanity Prize. And what they've done is set out to say, you know what, a lot of the work that's out there around natural language processing or translation, it's concentrating on the languages that exist today because of a system of power. How do we take the same tools and apply them to dying or extinct languages that are held closely by indigenous peoples? And instead of just saying, we'll come in and capture those languages for you, how do we embed those tools directly in those communities so that people can become stewards, not just of their own languages, but their own identities? Mm -hmm. right? We see it with groups like the Hidden Genius Project, a group that I know you and I have talked about before, right? That's not thinking about these big picture questions of building a diverse workforce so we can build better technology. 
They're thinking about how you put technological skills in the hands of young black men in America right now. So they individually can take agency about their career paths and what they want to do in their lives. Now, of course, that's going to lead to a better technological infrastructure in the future. But we have to start from the intention of saying, how do we put it right in the hands of the people that are most vulnerable? You talk a lot about this, right? And so I'm curious what you're inspired by in diverse, in underserved communities. Where are you seeing people actually taking ownership of their tech? And I'm going to ask you also, where are you seeing them bringing their creativity and their imagination and their aspiration to what that tech does for them? The little sparks that I see are what give me optimism, but they're little sparks. Yeah. Um, it should be igniting and the brightest light just from an American comp competitive point of view. If you're looking from the viewpoint of America and how it competes, you would think every single inner city would not only have a, a basketball court and a football field, it would have computer science and robotics and autonomy in every single classroom from K through 12. But we, but it's not. But what I, what I saw is kids that were embarrassed at their fathers. I come from an all Mexican neighborhood. So the kids that joined my robotics program were ashamed of their fathers because they worked odd jobs and hung out by Home Depot to go fix people's houses in Beverly Hills. They didn't realize the value of their father when, up until their father helped them build their robot that helped them win the regional. It's when, when they saw what their dad can do. And now they have a different perspective on building, but they, never, they, they were never given the opportunity to value what their kid did because Hollywood and LA and popular culture they deem that as a low paying job. Um, when building is the one of the best creative things to do, whether you're building a shed or you're fixing someone's yard or you're building a house, the builders are the builders. At what point in time did we do we look at that as not cool yeah. or not valuable? Yeah. Um, but I saw it firsthand with my robotics team. When um, Cynthia's dad helped them build their robot and how far not only did it take the team, but how far it took their appreciation for building and it connected, you know, father and daughter, it connected team and parent. Um, and if we can get every single inner city to compete in robotics as just like a uh, duh it is that we compete with sports treating robotics like sport is a recipe for an amazing tomorrow you know well i'm so taken by that idea right soccer fields and basketball courts and robotics labs um i was very lucky i grew up the child of immigrants in rural illinois but i happened to grow up six blocks away from a center for supercomputing that the government had put in champaign illinois so i grew up on one side really exposed to lots of interesting devices and toys. I learned how to code video games when I was very young. But I'll tell you the part that shaped my philosophy, and it, it feels so connected to your stories. I'd go back to India, where my family's from, and I'd sit down with my grandfather, who was a very smart man, even though he'd only gone through second grade, right? That was the last year of schooling he got. I tried to show him all this stuff that I had built. And say, you know what? I'm excited because you're excited for the toys and the tech. But tell me how it makes my life better. How does it make the life of a villager in the field better? How does it make the life of a kid who's aspiring to have a family better? It seems like we have to have both of those stories, right? One is we have to create access. And the second is we have to put right at the center of the conversation purpose. What is it we're trying to build together? And I want to come back to this idea that that takes more than just technology and technologists. So as you work with these young men and women across the country in an exceptional program that gives people access to skills, I'm also thinking about the stories they're being exposed to about what it means to be a young person of color in the world that we live in today and how technology can actually solve some of the problems they face and how they address them. I'm thinking about how technology advances equity, but at the same time, equity advances technology. Um, does that resonate for you? And what are you kind of seeing these kids doing that like is shaping that worldview into the skills they're building? 
you drive down the street and you see these huge buildings if you live in the city. And in popular culture, you don't aim to compete with the people that built the buildings. You go to a restaurant and you go to the restroom and the maintenance manager or the janitor, we don't value in popular culture their position to keep everything moving and clean and working. And then you turn on the TV. No, very rarely does someone say, man, how is this TV working? They're, we are, we're fascinated by the people that sing it on the TV or acting on the TV. And every year there's an Oscars or an Emmy. And we watch them walk the red carpet. And we watch them receive that Grammy. And I know that because I've won Grammys. And very rarely, probably never, does anyone go up there and accept an award and thank the technologist that made the camera, that so, made the lights, that made the microphone, the keyboard. The engineers are invisible. Yeah. But why? Why can't engineers be celebrated? Why can't all the innovators, the tinkers, the folks that are spinning the boards and creating the firmware and uh, OTA programmers, algorithm writers, you know, data trainers, the data scientists, why can't all these folks be the Michael Jordans and be visible like LeBron James? Yep. Why can't all the folks, the engineers that made that skyscraper safe in a fault line called the San Andreas Fault, where I live in Los Angeles, why can't we know their name in popular culture? Well, I it's think not as if it. that industry, all, the industry around engineering and science and robotics isn't one of the wealthiest industries in the world with tons and tons of money pumped into it. Like, where do we go wrong? How do we inspire these kids to want this path, to be involved in this conversation? And uh, sorry for, for running around. No, um, I love it. The, 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 what you told me just inspired, my, inspired me to look at, like, why and what do we have to do to get that a part of our, you know, the fabric of popular culture? Well, I love that answer. I'm inspired by you. I'm inspired by this image that we've created together of a future that's architected by all of us. It's not so much about who we identify and lift up, but how we champion those who are the most imaginative, the most creative, the ones who are building a better future for everyone. Um, I want to thank you for taking this time with me. And I want to say to all of the solvers out there, these are the aspirations that we know you hold. And we can't wait to see what you do with them as you go forward. So thank you to you all. Thank you, Will. Thank you, MIT Solve. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Will and Villas, for such a lively and inspiring conversation. As Will I am said, tech innovators of color shouldn't be little sparks of hopes, but the brightest lights. So, some exciting news and hot off the press. I am thrilled to announce that today, the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation pledged another $200,000 in funding for our 2021 challenges through the AI for Humanity Prize. So, that means that we're now over $2 million in available funding. Thank you so much, Vilas Liz and the team at McGovern. And I just wanted to come back for a minute to the exclusive news you heard here today from Nuba Afayan, the founder of Cherban and Moderna. They are committing 500 million doses for the COVAX program for low-income countries. This is big news and critical to recognize the role we all can play to ensure health security.